Bobby's Bye Bye Baby Buggy Boggin Bazaar is on Balboa Boulevard. This is Bunny Beebe's Bye Bye Baby Buggy Boggin Bazaar on Bonnie. <laughs> TV Crazy Man here once again with even more classic television bloopers and goofs from the 1960s. I found some more behind the scenes bloopers and put together some goofs I found in the last month or so on this one super fun humongous video. So take your shoes off and sit a spell and let's take a look back at the best times in television entertainment. That's a nice device. I can't talk to you now. We're in the midst of a cult. The security of the whole United States is at stake, and it's only a cult. Blarabee has become a blabber mouth lately. I know, Max. I've got to get rid of him. Right. Aaron and Joshua are cold-blooded, ruthless killers. From the second you put foot in the... Cut it. What do we do till they get here? <gasps> Max, I just remembered something. I used up the... the uh, blah, blah, blah. You used up the blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that too. No, Max, I'm fine. In fact, the doctor said I've never been in better bit of physical... I don't want to! Fang is just as competent as I am. Max, how are they going to kill the scientists? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry to disturb you at an hour like this, but this is a blue emergency emert. <laughs> this happens to be the end of your little kidnapping operation. Kidnapping? I am still offering $250,000 for Maxwell Schmidt, dead or alive. If, correction, dead or dead. <laughs> hey -ya! So you're Mr. Big. So you're Maxwell Smart. There's a few interesting goose from the very first episode of Get Smart. It was the only episode of the series to be filmed in black and white. The villain was played by Michael Dunn, who is famous as the reoccurring villain Dr. Loveless on the uh, Wild Wild West TV series. Toward the end of the episode when Smart makes his escape, we see two Chaos agents stand by a door which shows several bullet holes. Then we see Max firing a machine gun. Now the bullet holes on the door are gone. That's one magic machine gun. I find that pretty hard to believe. Would you believe the gun in this chaos agent's hand magically transforms from a revolver to an automatic right before our eyes? Believe it or not. Before Mr. Big blows up his floating headquarters, Max and 99 jump into a small boat and appear to make it far enough away to survive the explosion. But instead of being in the middle of the water, they appear to be attached to something or at least right next to something, a dock or a boat of some sort. Now Barbara Feldon, who played Agent 99, was 5 foot 8 inches tall, just one inch taller than Don Adams. Missed it by that much. And of course they wanted Maxwell Smart to look as tall as possible, so she would sometimes go barefoot, as seen in the episode School Days, when we accidentally see her bare feet in a mirror. Tired of walking around on his lips. That's all right, I'm the only girl with calluses on her ankles. Here's a blink and you miss it, Goo. And this one, Fang goes in one side and ends up on the other. See if you can spot this goof in the day Smart turned chicken. Below this window is a chaos truck full of mattresses. As the bad guy jumps from the window, you can not only see his shadow on the painted cityscape behind him, but you can also see it flapping as he jumps by. Missed it by that much. <laughs> leap, Fang, leap! In the episode Our Man and Leotards, Max has a special ring on that causes anyone he touches to be instantly immobilized. Notice now that the Chief's hands are down at his side. <laughs> now the Chief has one of his hands raised, and the Ambassador now has a ribbon around his neck that he didn't have before. But then Maxwell takes off the ribbon from his neck and puts it on the ambassador who now doesn't have a ribbon on his neck until Max puts his on his neck. It's confusing. And now you also notice that the chief's arms are back down to his side. Hey, man, let me do that one more time. All I right, couldn't see what that One more time, that's all. Get the all line, all right. All right. You know, I think the good thing about goofs and bloopers is that it reminds us that everyone makes mistakes. So you might as well laugh at yourself and the world around you while you can. And try not to take life so seriously. 
covers everything. Edward Platt, who played the chief, appears to be laughing out a character after Dakota Silence smashes his desk. I guess he got tickled by the whole thing. In the episode I'm Only Human, Maxwell Smart's left hand has, is gloved, and then the glove is off, and then the glove is on, and then it's off again. Oh dear. <laughs> this episode, keep an eye out for a mysterious extra foot when Max gets thrown behind a desk. Either it belongs to his stuntman or somebody's missing the foot. Max clicks his heels with only one shoe on. 86 here. Yes, sir. Act natural. Right? In the middle of a shootout, bullet holes disappear from the sign behind Agent 99. Okay, but don't scare me. Boo! <laughs> in this episode, a parody of the Fugitive TV series, Max is riding in a police car with no dashboard, where the steering wheel appears to be mounted to some kind of stand. I think they set the camera a little too far back on this one. Gronsky, that was the one-handed man. Yeah, punk. Did you ever notice that sometimes Don Adams' stunt double seems to have a lot thicker hair than he did? Of course, you can see stuff like that a lot easier now with uh, high-definition television sets. There was a couple of times when it seemed like a door, or in this case, a closet door, would fall down just a, a fraction of a second before the explosion. I think it's interesting to see how they rigged doors to fall on their own like that. In the episode, Tequila Mockingbird, it almost appears as though a Mexican man is murdered by the use of a rubber sword. <laughs> Didn't you sit next to me in the movie the other night? In the episode The Pizza Parlor, is the radio operator in the background falling asleep or was he just looking down? Sure seems like he was nodding off. What is going on here? The world may never know. In the episode Psychic Commandant, in one shot we see Clink and General Burkhalter leaning on the car. Then in the next camera angle, where did Clink and Burkhalter go to? Then they're back again. I guess it's possible to use one of those new X-ray vision cameras. Exactly. In the episode The Safe Cracker Suite, Clink's chair is right behind Hogan, and it looks like we're about to get a good laugh watching Clink fall to the floor when he starts to sit down, but somehow the chair moves from Hogan's back to Clink's. Well, you have plenty of chances to laugh. In the cooler! In the episode Diamonds in the Rough, when the plane drops fake diamonds, the first shot looks like a man leaving the plane before turning into just cargo. In the episode, The Rise and Fall of Sergeant Schultz. During a fire diversion, Clink yells for water. Water! Carter and Hogan each have a bucket of water. As they start to throw the buckets of water, the view shifts from Carter and Hogan back to Clink, and we only see one bucket of water hitting Clink. Where'd the other bucket go? Who knows, maybe his contract stipulated that there's to only be one bucket of water per episode. Okay, cool it. Okay. All right, ready? Of course. Yes, very decadent. But <laughs> we have ways and means of... <laughs> In the episode, How to Escape from Prison Camp Without Really Trying, when Clint comes down the stairs at a ski lodge, the chair by the stairs is clearly empty. Until Burkhalter just suddenly appears out of thin air. Or... Well, you know what I mean. Which, of course, is funny considering all the insults that Clink throws Burkhalter's way. But it also shows us yet another magic trick to ponder. Fat men are supposed to be jolly. General Burkhalter is just a nasty old tub of lard. <laughs> How's that? Okay. All right, ready? In the episode, Clink versus the Gunculator. Hogan is meeting with Clink, and there's some funny stuff going on in this scene. Notice the mirror above and behind Clink's head. 
Notice its position in relation to the green curtain. When Clint goes to stand up, the mirror's gone. He shot on location, and that location is the Twilight Zone. There's too much German activity near the near the uh <laughs> No no there's too much uh, German activity near the tunnel entrances. Exits. No, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes, very decadent. But we have ways of... Isn't that incredible? In the episode, The Missing Clink, Hogan is checking out a German compound. But has he taken a step into the Twilight Zone while doing so? Considering it's supposed to be World War II, how did those 1960s cars get there? A detour in time and found themselves one afternoon on the fringe of the future. Oh, this is my may say so. It was absolutely brilliant, So You can't get your hand into the bloody thing. <laughs> In the episode Bombsack, after a plane bombs a car, the car becomes a pile of junk that looks more like it imploded versus exploded. I mean, the parts of the car would likely have been much more scattered after an explosion like this. Allow me. Don't go. <coughs> Warning. Warning. You are watching the unfolding of one of history's great adventures. Do you remember when Lost in Space took place? It was a far off future date, October 16th, 1997. In one of my favorite episodes, Visit to a Hostile Planet in Season 3 has the Robisons going back in time to 1947. And we're 50 years out of our time. In one scene in that episode, Marine Robison acts like a telephone is something that has not been around for years, and yet they showed us someone using a telephone in the very first episode. In the episode, The Derelict, the Robisons are attacked by aliens that can best be described as giant meatballs that are on fire. And if that wasn't scary enough, one of them is actually wearing tennis shoes. In the episode, One of Our Dogs is Missing, John Robison has a problem with his laser gun. See, previously you could see the laser beam shooting out of his gun. In this scene, it looks like actor Guy Williams is pulling the trigger lighting up the end of the laser pistol, but maybe they forgot to add in the laser beam light shooting out to complete the effect. In the episode The Space Trader, Will and Dr. Smith are walking around and they run into whatever this is. What do you think it is? I have the faintest idea. Me neither. Well, since they weren't too sure what to think about this strange whatever it is, they decide to send their stunt doubles up to check on it and are immediately attacked by dogs. Notice the dog trainer wants to make sure his dogs aren't eating the stunt doubles alive. He peeks around the boxes to take a look. Dr. Smith! In this scene from the space trader, I understand from other commentaries that the robot actually fell over backwards, knocking out Bob May, the man inside the robot. You know, I have to wonder if he wished at that time that he had this guy's job and just did the voice of the robot. Danger! Danger! In the episode, The Space Croppers, when a werewolf reverts back into a man, its footprints revert from wolf tracks to shoe tracks. I guess he changed into shoes really quick. In the episode, All That Glitters, Smith puts on a ring that lights up. May I introduce myself, ladies? Dr. Zachary Smith. Now, if you look at Dr. Smith's feet, you'll see that this particular gizmo operates via a long extension cord. Indeed. In the episode The Ghost Planet, you can see something pulling the robot across the dry ice. Negative. In the episode Forbidden World, Dr. Smith drinks explosives. Oh, how could this happen to me? The robot says that Smith must stay away from everyone as he could explode at any moment. No! Later, Marine Robison asks Will to take some food to Dr. Smith. The robot promises to make sure Will stays at a safe distance. Dr. Smith! Oh, it's you, William. Which makes me wonder exactly what would he consider a safe distance. Later, Will gives Smith 
Some pills they hope will render the explosives in Smith's system harmless. The robot tests to see if Smith is not explosive anymore by attempting to detonate him as he stands right next to Will. You might argue the robot knew that Dr. Smith would not explode. We may never know. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Do you insist on an answer? You know, they really just don't make rocks like they used to. In the episode, Time Merchant, Smith goes back into time, and when he's transported back, it looks like he's been replaced by a man wearing a Smith mask, for some reason. Could it be that time travel requires a stuntman? We interrupt this program for a quick word from Freddy Cat Cartoons. Hey y'all, check out the latest cartoon, Freddy Cat Cartoons. Fred's here my new friend, Robinson Crusoe. He's as primitive as can be. I'll thank you. I'll thank you very much. Don't you speak English, sir? He started it! Did not! Did too! Well. Indeed. <laughs> On the episode, Charlie X, Kirk is on his way to the bridge with Charlie. I'm on my way to the bridge now. He's going directly to the bridge alongside Charlie and notice he's wearing his regular golden shirt. We are at full output enterprise. I must speak to Captain Kirk. I suppose in the future they may have adapted some of Batman's technology. Fascinating. In the episode, Where No Man Has Gone Before, Time seems to act a little wonky on the bridge. Watch what happens when Kirk steps off the elevator onto the bridge. See this guy in a blue shirt? In one shot, he's past Kirk, heading toward the elevator. You ready, Mr. Alden? Acknowledge, Mr. Mitchell. You know, I think Kirk had a serious sense of deja vu. And watch as the other guy in the blue shirt seems to completely disappear. Guess he went where no man has gone before. Later, Mitchell uses his newly acquired mental superpowers to knock a rock down next to Kirk, but closer observation concludes that he may have had a helping hand. This could also be evidence that Thing from the Adams Family is either a time traveler or is immortal. I am pretty sure that I've seen Lurch hanging out in the Star Trek universe. You know, I've often thought that Captain Kirk is a lot stronger than we seem to think. I mean, look how he pushes in solid rock so easily. In the first part of the two-parter, The Menagerie, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are beaming down, but somehow a hedge gets brought down with them. If you look at the weird-looking statue, you'll notice there's no hedge anywhere around it. Then when they beam down, you can see in the close-up that now there is a hedge. But quite impossible. In the episode, The Conscious of the King, Star Day. Lieutenant Uhura sings a very slow song at the request of this very bored individual. How does she sing the last word of the song with her mouth closed? And does her choice in music mean music in the future is going to be really slow? Hey, I said it's really slow, not necessarily terrible. In the episode, surely if Captain Kirk gets into a fight with what amounts to a figure from his imagination, or at least his past. When this figure from Kirk's past, named Finnegan, throws the captain over, Kirk is lying on the ground, shirt intact. And then suddenly, without even moving from that spot, his shirt is suddenly ripped to shreds. Could it be that Kirk flexed his mighty muscles while on his back ripping his shirt apart? You know, actually, Shatner was ahead of his time because every action hero was ripping his shirt off in the 80s. Also, in this episode, there's a scene where you can see what looks like smoke coming from somebody smoking next to the cameraman. On the episode, The Galileo 7, Spock leads a team that is attacked by giants. In one scene, the giant spear appears to be coming from one direction, but Spock is aiming in the opposite direction. 
If I didn't know any better, I'd almost think that Leonard Nimoy didn't himself know which direction he was supposed to be aiming for. Of course, in all fairness, we can't see where the giant's at. Maybe he jumped across. But what I find baffling is why the giant's shield seems to be a normal human-sized shield when it falls down, and when Spock goes to investigate it, it's grown to giant proportions. Illogical. Totally. Even though the shuttle is in sort of bad shape in this scene, the doors still have automatic sound effects, even though it appears somebody is opening the door by hand. So, I'm not sure if this is a goof or not. When Spock gets hit by a big boulder, it's almost as if it's so light that he's really having to hold it in place so it doesn't roll off of him. In the episode Tomorrow is Yesterday, one of my favorite episodes by the way, because time travel just happens to be one of my favorite storylines. In this episode, the computer screens may have been affected by the time travel that occurred at the beginning of the episode because they look more like paper than actual screens. They have a very wrinkled look to them. Kind of like most of the posters in my comic book room. Hope you're enjoying the video so far. Please don't forget to leave a comment, let me know what you think, and let everybody else know what you think. Hopefully it's good. One of the benefits, some might say, about better television screens and higher definition is we notice things we might have missed on older TV sets back in the day. Like when our favorite actors have been replaced with stuntmen. Why did you do that? <laughs> on the episode, The Return of the Archons, Kirk's landing party ends up in the middle of chaos in a town that looks suspiciously a lot like Mayberry, where the locals have gone into a frenzy and are throwing rocks at everybody. One of Kirk's men appears to get hit on the head with a rock and it seems to just bounce off. Talk about hard-headed. Or was there something wrong with that rock? Okay, I'm not suggesting that they should have thrown real rocks for the sake of realism. We live in a world where you have to clarify everything these days. That's a joke, boy! You missed it! Went right past you! you when they go inside a nearby building to seek shelter, the windows and the doors disappear once they're on the inside. I don't understand this. Later in the episode, a computer attacks the crew with a hypersonic sound wave. Before that happens though, the guy in the back to your left jumped the gun just a bit, covering his ears a minute or so before the actual attack. Oh. It seems as though the actor confused the sound of the hologram appearing, possibly with the sound of the attack. What do they want from us? Before that scene, the townsfolk act like zombies and force Kirk to fire phasers on stun. You know, I thought it was really nice of the zombie lady on the ground to move her leg out of the way so that they could get by. The next goof comes from the episode Space Seed, which is the one that introduces us to Khan, played by Ricardo Montalban, who I've always enjoyed watching act. After Kirk's conversation with Khan, the actor playing a security guard changes between shots as Kirk leaves. Plus, of course, the actor was losing hair really fast. You know, you have to wonder how much laser guns cost. Next, a goo from the episode, A Piece of the Action. The crew has landed on a gangster planet. Notice the bench that Captain Kirk is leaning on. How did it get back there so fast? You see, one second, Kirk is on the sidewalk with Spock and McCoy, and the next split second, he's not. What was the worst episode of the original series, you may ask? It may be the third season episode, Spock's Brain. According to Shatner, this was one of the worst, and Leonard Nimoy said he was embarrassed during the entire shooting of this episode. His brain is gone. In this episode, they actually have Spock running around without a brain. The crew has been given belts that inflict pain upon the person wearing the belt. One second, you see Spock's brainless body is wearing one, 
and the other second, he's not. And then he is again. Oh well, all episodes can't be winners. And now, some classic Star Trek bloopers. You have no right. And we have the right. But you have no right. Because we're the right. And you're the right. Refuse to move out on cue? Screw them! Oh. Have no fear. Sargon is here. <laughs> I want you to know, in the Russians, I am doing this shot under protest. I don't know about you, but this is not the way it must I want to move! Don't anybody move. Admiral! I am receiving hailstorms. <laughs> I think we'll find what we're looking for at the Cetacean Institute in Sausalito. Here, I want back nails. Nails? Yes. <laughs> well, Captain, you forgot all about the environment and all that stuff. Do you want to really do that? What does it mean, exact change? I'm trying to think of a good answer, but the film is going to the camera and it's giving me a sense of anxiety. Hey, I realize how much trouble one little bullet could cause so much trouble. In the episode Bad Bad on a 459 Silent, a blooper was actually created by a bad edit of two different readings of Van Williams' line. I never realized how much trouble one little bullet could cause so much trouble. You try me, Clark. Just try me. Also in that episode, the Green Hornet is pointing his glove finger at the dirty cops. But the next second, the glove is gone. Also in that episode, it looks like the cop is landing on a stunt man's mattress, conveniently placed in the warehouse. Aren't you jumping to conclusions? But that's not all. Now notice where the two guys are fighting at. So just where in the world are those hands coming from? Aren't you jumping to conclusions? The next goof comes from the episode Alias to Scarf, which guest starred the Dracula actor and horror legend, John Carradine. No. It's true, I did find a goof in that episode. Since you doubt the supernatural, let us say that you were mistaken. Notice the Green Hornet and Cato wax replicas. Carradine playing the villain, of course, threatens this lady. Then suddenly, the wax statues of the Green Hornet and Cato come to life and subdue the villain. But are we to believe that these statues were the Green Hornet and Cato all along? I shudder, but I fear we shall have to accept what people have seen. In the episode, Hornet Save Thyself, a sign has a grammatical error that totally makes its meaning unclear. The word two should have two O's, because now it sounds like they're saying that they won't work for people that are large. Hey, I'm not judging. I make spelling errors all the time. You might even find one on this video. In the episode, Watch the Birdie, when she blinks Major Nelson's uniform on him, more people blink in behind him. Just think of the implications here. See if you can spot what goes wrong in this scene where Jeannie blinks herself into a wedding dress. Do you like it, Master? Did you catch it? 
So apparently Jeannie's powers have side effects every time she uses them. You know, like opening drawers. In the episode Jin Jin the Pied Piper, Major Healy goes to a phone booth to make a phone call. And when Dr. Bellows arrives, though, it looks like Major Healy has finished his phone call. But then he's back in the phone booth again in the next scene. And seemingly on the same conversation. <laughs> now apparently Jeannie had to blink Major Healy temporarily into a dummy to protect him from harm. Hmm. But where are the phone wires connecting to the booth, I wonder? Later, the general is being trampled on by a Marmaduke lookalike, and so Jeannie blinks to apparently freeze the dog, but the general is frozen instead. But for some reason, the dog disappears at the same time, even though Jeannie's supposed to have missed. Then we see the general moving after having been frozen when the dog is back in his face again. Apparently, magic is no match against dog slobber. In the episode Happy Anniversary, the opening shot shows Tony's house in sunny daylight. But when he wakes up, Jeannie says it's four in the morning. That's a little too soon for daylight, even in Florida. That's even early for Cocoa Beach. In that same episode, Jeannie redirects Tony's rocket to the same island that he originally freed her from her bottle. But this time, he ends up freeing the evil blue Jen instead. It was played by Michael Ansara. He was Barbara Eden's real-life husband at the time. Well, here's another goof from that episode anniversary. When the blue gin lifts Tony Nelson up in the air, in the background you see some power lines, which is a little unusual for a deserted island. And from what I've read, this beach is probably the lagoon from Gilligan's Island. But, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure on that. Maybe you can tell me in the comments. You see this area again at the end of the episode, along with those power lines across the sky. Next is a coincidence that strangely predicted the future of an entirely different series starring Larry Hagman, first in the episode My Master the Civilian. In this episode, Jeannie uses a future-telling machine to see how Tony's life would turn out if he quit the space program and took a civilian job. Coincidentally, the interior set for Tony's office is the same one for Darren Stevens' office in Bewitched. Here's the report you asked for. Thank you, sir. Hey. Yes, strangely enough, if you combine the names of the two secretaries, you get the name of Larry Hagman's wife on Dallas, Sue Ellen. I, I won't be able to explain this if I live to be, if I live to be your age. If it was just that alone, it wouldn't, maybe it wouldn't be that big a deal, but there's more. A couple of seasons later in the episode, Black Male Order Bride, a woman pretends to be Tony's wife. And her name is Sue Ellen. Believe it or not. Wow! <laughs> In this scene, while Tony is listening to the football game, Jeannie blinks and pops out his earpiece. At the same time, a mysterious head pops up in the bottom right. But for some strange reason, neither Tony nor Jeannie seem to notice. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jeannie. In this scene where Tony sneaks back into his own house, there's something not quite right here. It looks like Jeannie's blinking a few seconds too late. I mean, you assume that she's the one to turn the lights on with the blinking, but then she doesn't blink until like five seconds later. All right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Jeannie. And why is he yelling? Oh! Ah! In the episode, The Wedding, Jeannie falls off the sofa. I've read that this was an accident and they just went with it. Of course, I wasn't there, so I can't be sure. What do you think? It seems a little uncharacteristic for Barbara Eden to be doing the slapstick falls. That was Larry Hagman's gig. Hungry, hungry, num num num. In this episode, when the harem girl eats the apple, part of her hand disappears. And this is because the screen is split in the two. See, they had to combine two uh, sets of film in order to make it look like Tony was super small. I was just trying to get major this. Tony's supposed to be weightless in this scene, but it's easy to see that there's a board that's lifting him up in the air. Well, let's go back in time to the wild, wild west. The series starred Robert Conrad as Jim West, a sort of James Bond of the old west. Ross Martin played his fellow government agent Artemis Gordon, a master of disguise. 
Yes, that's right. That's, that's what I am. This action-packed, slightly sci-fi western required a lot of cool stunts that actor Robert Conrad liked to do for himself, for the most part, until this particular stunt didn't go quite as planned. From what I read, he had to go to the hospital after this stunt. Notice how he appears to hit his head when he lands. Now after this episode, you can see stuntmen filling in for Conrad from time to time. This particular stunt from a uh, first season episode puts Conrad up there in superhero territory. And if you look closely, you can see the table he lands on is made for landing as it's uh, made out of some kind of cushiony material, which is a good thing because he might have had to go to the hospital sooner if he would have landed on a hard table. <laughs> Now, in the Season 2 episode, The Night of the Ready-Made Corpse, notice that Jim West is getting really dirty as he's fighting these guys. But, in true action hero Hollywood style, Robert Conrad doesn't stay dirty long. I guess Jim West's suit was a little bit resistant to dirt, sort of the whole secret agent thing. You know? In the episode, The Night of the Running Death, the actor that looks like Mr. Clean is missing Jim West by a mile with this punch. Even on a sci-fi western like the Wild Wild West, they didn't want modern modes of transportation popping up. But sometimes it did happen, and with big screen HD TV sets we have these days, it's easier to see those instances where modern civilization infiltrated the Old West. Another Jetter airplane pops up in the episode The Night of the Gruesome Games. In the episode The Night of the Turncoat, it looks kind of like they filmed it near an interstate. You can even see what looks like maybe a truck driving by on the far left. And this one admittedly is kind of hard to see, but if you look sort of toward your right, uh, you'll see a vehicle passing behind the bushes. I don't know, it's just always neat to me to see a car drive by on a western. In the episode, The Night of the Turncoat, in an underwater scene, a man in scuba gear pops up behind Jim West for no apparent reason. Not to mention the fact that I don't think scuba gear was a thing in the OS, but then of course this was the Wild Wild West TV show where such a thing could be possible, I suppose. Here's a bit of a magic trick for you. In the episode The Night of the Firebrand, Jim West is hung on a pole by the bad guys. His hands and feet are tied. Underneath Jim West are boxes of dynamite. So as the bad guys are about to leave the fort, they light the fuse. Then suddenly, without any explanation, Jim West's ankles are no longer tied up, which makes it much easier to escape. Last month or, or so ago, when I was watching the episode The Night of the Iron Fist, I was actually a little confused with this uh, one scene. See, during a shootout at this old abandoned shack, the scenes alternate between daylight for the outside shots and what looks like nighttime through the windows inside the old house. They even went as far as having crickets in the background noise to make it feel like nighttime inside the house. Probably what happened was they were meant to shoot the outside scenes with a filter that would have darkened the image to look like it was night. I know they used to do that a lot on old TV shows. Sometimes it came off as kind of strange looking, but it might have helped make this scene make better sense. To save money, there was no way they were going to actually film this again once they realized their mistake. In the episode, The Night of the Bubbling Death, West uses a glass cutter to retrieve the U.S. Constitution, which was lying flat under a covering sheet of glass. But when he reaches in and pulls out the document, it's magically rolled up instantaneously. From flat to rolled. Almost instantaneously. Believe it or not. Artie, you cover the back door. Wait a minute. That doesn't look like Artemis. Does that guy look like Artie to you? At times, Ross Martin had some health issues. He even had a heart attack at one point, and he had to miss a few episodes. So occasionally, I think they had to throw in stand-ins just to finish out the episodes. Well, thanks for watching this video on the TV Crazy Man channel. Please subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you don't miss any future videos. Let me know what you think about the video in the comments below. Thanks, and have a great day. Give me time to think it all.